Okay, we're back. This is the spotlight on data science and big data. This is Dave Vellante of wikibon.org and I'm here with my co-host Jeff Kelly. And we're live at EMC World 2012 and the theme of the show is transformation. We talked a lot yesterday about cloud being the IT trans transformative piece, but really it's data is transforming business. And it's all about packaging information, monetizing information, getting value out of information. That's the business transformation. Of course, there's also a big transformation of skill sets, and EMC's talking a lot about that. But today we're talking about really the business impact, the data, the value, the transformation. We're here with Steve Hillian, who's the Chief Product Officer of Alpine Data Labs. Stephen, welcome to theCUBE. Dave, nice to meet you. Great yeah. to have you on. And um, so, Chief Product Officer, I asked you off camera, is the product data? And you said yes. Uh, talk yeah, about the, that a little bit. Uh, the product really, as you were saying, is sort of the insights coming out of that data. Uh -huh. um, I think increasingly organizations are either turning their data into value or worrying that they may not be doing that enough. Uh, they've got these mountains of data that are piling up, all the traditional data that they've been getting out of their transactional systems, but now increasingly machine generated data, web behavior, just piling up and this sense of how do we make the most value out of that? How can we use that to really understand our customers better? And that's really what we're about, sort of turning that into deeper analytics than may have traditionally been done in the past, getting real value. So what does Alpine actually sell? So we sell an application that allows you to do predictive analytics on really large quantities of data without having to set up a massive new infrastructure. In fact, what you can do is you can download our product literally off the web, point it at the source of your data, typically going to be sitting in a relational database, like Greenplum, for example, uh, and then just start doing predictive analytics. I, I think traditionally people have thought about predictive analytics as something that's difficult, hard, expensive. You have to hire a team of PhDs. Build a model. Build the model, Refine the, the model, mo test the model. Yeah, you have to go iterate, back to the well to get more data, and that's the slow calibrate process. Calibrate it. It's, it's cumbersome, right? I mean, it, it typically takes you like six months to produce like a churn model or a new product recommendation model. And uh, for us, we want to make that like radically simpler. Really spin down the amount of time you spend producing those models by going straight to the data source and doing the analytics where the data lives. Okay, but so do you have the capability to essentially, on the fly, build that model within the database? Yeah, that's right. So this actually came out of, that's exactly what we do. Um, Sounds like magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it certainly took a lot of uh, hard work, and in fact, uh, I can't claim all the credit ourselves. This actually came out. A lot of early work that was being done at companies like MySpace and Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, and Greenplum itself, actually. And also some academic work that was happening at uh, Berkeley, uh, under the leadership of Professor Hellestein there, Joe Hellestein, who's uh, sort of expert in Yeah, we've had databases. Joe on theCUBE. Oh, actually, great, yeah. yeah, yeah. Fantastic guy, very bright, obviously. Yeah. And really sort of saw this, had this insight based on his interaction with industry uh, and with his team that you could actually do analytics directly where the data is sitting. In a, in a sense, Hadoop is an inspiration for that, right? Because Hadoop is not just about storing and retrieving data, it's a computational platform. Mm -hmm. And it's like the database vendors over time um, have gotten better at doing more complex calculations. And so they were thinking, can we actually do these more complicated sort of analyses where we're building models and scoring them directly in the database. And so we've built a company around that. So talk a little bit more about why uh, in database predictive analytics. I mean, what's the real appeal from a value prop standpoint? Well, I think a big thing for, for, for me that sort of really um, inspired me when I first heard about uh, Alpine, got involved with them at the founding and decided eventually to join the company, um, was that they, they just made the whole thing so much easier. Um, so I had been involved in many analytics projects really for the last decade where the process of getting the data and refining the data, building the models and iterating and so on, it wasn't even iterative, right? I mean, it's just like highly waterfall, highly static, sort of one-shot model development. It's like, I hope this works. I hope this is the right data set and if we need to go back to the well, it's just too painful. Um, and what Alpine was doing, um, working with Greenplum, because there's actually an early spin-off from Greenplum, is going into customer sites and say, just give it, point us at your data, and we'll find something interesting, like this afternoon. <laughs> um, and so, instant I, I, ROI. Instant yeah. ROI. I mean, I remember the first time we used it. Um, so this is when I was working uh, with my data scientist team, actually using Alpine. I loved it so much. I joined the company. Um, I went into a, a, a telco, which had no data scientists, right? Never done churn models or advanced analytics before. Um, and literally by the end of that day, we just took the source of their data, did the analytics directly where it sat, and we had churn models, pretty decent 
not like maybe production level, pretty decent churn models that they could actually use. So you could see things immediately, trends that you could act on, you're saying. That's exactly And when you talk about churn models, you're talking about customer churn. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in telco that's a big thing, right? Because yeah. people right. are constantly shifting their allegiances in terms of cell phone providers, uh, right. service providers. And so, um, predicting whether that's going to happen, obviously things like your account ending, uh, your account date, your subscription ending is going to be a big predictor of that, but there are more subtle predictors like ratios of text messages to voice and uh, how often you use it at the weekend, and sort of declines in usage, and whether you're talking to people who themselves have recently- Pricing, uh, device, avail uh, device availability. Did you get a spike in your Yeah, billing? timing yeah. of uh, product availability, you know, if you're Sprint, you don't have the iPhone, and all of a sudden you have it. I mean, there's so many factors that- That's right, I mean, typically- matrix there, I mean. Hugely complicated, yeah. often you'll have hundreds if not thousands of variables and going into these sorts of models. Uh, and uh, you know, one interesting thing is that you, then you need to go to the business, right? You need to go to the business and say, what are the variables, what do you think is likely to predict churn loss? So one of the secrets of Alpine as well is that because it's all exposed through a nice simple UI, right, you've got all this power of the data infrastructure behind it, but a very simple UI is that the business can get involved as well and say, well, what if we try this variable? And actually start clicking around it themselves. So it becomes a sort of collaborative environment um, uh, for people to do analytics uh, together and to maybe get business analysts and people, sort of what we call aspirational data scientists, get them involved in the process as well. Because it's so easy to get it up and running, uh, it's a little less scary. So churn models is obviously one use case. Yeah. Are, are, is, is it, are your algorith algorithms specifically tuned toward churn models or do you have you know, other use cases? Can it be applied more generically? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a general tool right now. I think for an early stage startup like us, it can be useful to fix onto certain verticals. We're, we're typically aimed at sort of finance, uh, healthcare, retail, um, uh, entertainment is another big one. Uh, uh, places like we are in now uh, often do a lot of analytics uh, in sort of in Vegas uh, to, to, to sort of target their customers better. Um, but we've done stuff all over the map. I mean, we most recently did something in the healthcare industry uh, where we're predicting patient outcomes, uh, like the, the, uh, the event of a cardiac um, uh, arrest happening based on uh, patient profiles. Went in and just did a very sort of quick, simple proof of concept about that. Uh, you know, building product recommendation engines. We've done stuff where we've looked at elect uh, the electricity grid, or actually looking at smart meters and being able to detect fraud or detect uh, likelihood of outages or vegetation growing in and interrupting service, uh, just all over the map. Um, uh, so that's kind of fun, building something very general. Are the models um, you know, didactic? Are they, do they, are they self-learning? Uh, do they get smarter over time? Oh, well, that, that's a really interesting point. I think um, one of the problems with the traditional analytics process, because it takes so long from end to end, by the time you get to the end of it, the idea that you want to refine this, oh, I'm exhausted, I want to go home. Um, whereas if you can, if, you know, the goal, I think the goal for an analytics project is you rebuild your models every night. If you, I mean, if mm. anybody out there right now, if you're not building your models every night, there's something wrong with your process. That, th th like, this is really important, yeah, because yeah, this yeah, is a yeah. completely different mindset, right? We're used to, okay, every, every at the end of every month, I'm going to put in a little bit more data, maybe yeah, one, two, right. maybe 10% more data, and that yeah. model is a god model, and you don't want to change it, and you, you add to it and it gets layered, and you're saying, no, no, no. throw it away. Absolutely. Yeah. It's Start the, it's, over. It's like the lessons from the Agile movement, right? From, this, from the mm -hmm. Agile software movement, which is build early and test often uh, and just constantly refine things. I mean, the number of analytics projects that I've seen that have really gotten stalled because you're aiming for perfection, your R squared has to be so high and your MAPES have to be this good, um, and it's like, screw that. You want simple, interpretive, functional models. What do you want, right? Do you want the perfect model that predicts with absolute precision in six months time, once all your customers have left anyway, <laughs> or they've decided, or your product pr portfolios have changed, or customer behaviors have changed, or do you want a model that's pretty damn good right now, right? And that's what I think people need to be aiming for, you know? Um, just across the board uh, is just a different approach to predictive analytics. Yeah, pretty, pretty damn good, or even good enough to yeah, act upon. That's if you right. can act upon it and extract value, yeah then that's pretty damn good. Yeah, that's right, oh. that's right. That's right. right, so what about changing, changing mindsets? I mean, because that is really not the way, as we talked about, uh, traditionally people look at a B